This meeting is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you and welcome to today's webinar. We ask that if you are not already on mute to stay on mute for the duration of today's session as this will reduce background noise for the recording. A brief word about logistics and we'll be off. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time during today's presentation, but all questions will be answered after both presentations have concluded. Please note that you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type your question in the provided field and hit submit. If you've joined us today at NCI, please come to a microphone to ask your question live in the room. We will be joining the conversation on Twitter using hashtag NCIPMPH. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn today's session over to Dr. Debbie Wynn. Welcome. We're delighted that you are here to listen to our webinar on precision medicine and pop will precision medicine improve population health? This uh, webinar is sponsored by NCI's Precision Medicine and Population Sciences Interest Group. This is our inaugural webinar, so we hope you'll stay tuned and listen uh, to, to learn more uh, in upcoming months about future events. We're extremely delighted to have two fantastic speakers today. Uh, Dr. Galea will be speaking first. He's a physician and an epidemiologist uh, who is currently the dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, he also has been the chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University and has held other uh, academic and leadership positions at University of Michigan and New York Academy of Medicine. He's particularly interested in the social production of health of urban populations and he's focused on causes of brain disorders, uh, especially mood anxiety disorders and substance use. He's particularly interested in uh, issues related to mass trauma and conflict. I, our second speaker is Dr. Muin Khoury. He's the director of the CDC Office of Public Health Genomics. Uh, he has split his time here with uh, us here at uh, the National Cancer Institute for many years, divided uh, his, uh, his, he's been a busy man working both at CDC and NCI. He's formerly the Associate Director of our Extramural Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program, and currently he's been very actively involved in promoting a dialogue on precision medicine and public health. He has a PhD in uh, human genetics and genetic epidemiology and a, uh, an MD degree. Uh, he has published extensively in genetic epidemiology and public health, and he's very interested in the translation of science and research into public health settings. So both speakers have been extensively published in the scientific literature and their work is widely read and cited. They're both considered to be very influential thinkers and speakers, so we're very, very pleased to have them here today. We expect a, a lively presentation um, and a, 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 an exposition of alternative viewpoints. So uh, to remind you again, our topic today is will precision medicine improve population health? And with that, we will just get started. Um, thank you very much for, to Dr. Galea for starting us off today. It's all yours. Thank um, you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this with, uh, with uh, Moon and with the audience. So my, I was asked to, to uh, tackle this question and uh, I, um, I suppose I come at this from the point of view of uh, Actually, I don't know how to advance slides. Can I just say advance slide? Will somebody do that? Um, can we advance the slide? Hmm. I'm, uh, I'm hoping that somebody will is advancing the slide in the other end. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to pause until somebody tells me. Yep. Yeah. We're working on the technical de details of advancing the slides. Just uh, okay. Let me, uh, let, me just, let me just pause then. Ah, here we go. So I can just say advanced slide, will that work? That's fine. Okay. So uh, I, I was asked to, uh, to uh, take a position as a, what I'm calling it, the loyal opposition. Uh, I am uh, I'm, uh, coming from a point of view of, uh, of uh, someone who's uh, going to answer this question as I'm not so sure that precision medicine will improve population health. Next slide. Um, I have it loyal because I'm actually loyal to the aspirations of science. I actually am um, excited about the potential of precision medicine. I think there is a fair bit of mechanistic insight that will emerge from this exercise. Next slide. But uh, I'm opposed to compelling ideas that I am not convinced will advance population health, at least in their current formulation. Next slide. So as far as I'm concerned, there's only one question that matters. Will precision medicine approaches improve population health? And the answer I'm going to suggest is, next slide. 
no unless, and I'll explain what the unless in a second. So let me start with trying to answer my no and uh, offer three reasons why not. Next slide. So first of all, the first of the reasons is the challenges of complexity in biology, that um, a lot of precision medicine efforts are predicated on the assumption that we shall be able to determine the, the pathogenesis of disease so that we can intervene on particular genes, particular molecules, which will make a tremendous difference for individuals. The reality is that biology is much more complex than that. Next slide. This is from a paper that just came out recent, <coughs> excuse me, recently showing the um, population attributable fraction to genes for a wide variety of disorders. And this is really a best estimate um, summarizing this, sure, but as and everybody can see in any number of disorders, really the proportion of, uh, of uh, pathogenesis that is attributable to genes is in the 20, 30% range for the most part. That's just one simple illustration of why genetic factors matter relatively little. Next. Uh, next slide shows uh, a, um, a, uh, from the International Consortium for Blood Pressure a summary of GWAS, genome-wide association study, showing that there are a large number of variants that have been identified that are linked to, blood, to systolic blood pressure and uh, to diastolic blood pressure, all of them showing an effect of about one millimeter of mercury, showing an enormous number of variants which we don't understand how they work, all of which contributing to a fairly minor increase in blood pressure, which is our target of interest. Next slide. And at the level of uh, trials that have looked at this, this is from the SHIVA trial, uh, showing that uh, um, when uh, there was an attempt to use molecular target agents, targeted agents versus treatment as physician's choice, what you actually see here is the uh, progression, uh, progression free survival is roughly the same between molecular targeted agents and treatment as, physician, as physician's choice which really gets at the heart of the matter that, the, uh, um, that uh, at core, despite our efforts to molecularly target or genetically target, it's unclear we're going to have much, uh, much more gain over the choice of physicians. Next slide. A lot of this has been discussed in the context of cancer, and uh, there is no question that for some somatic cell tumors, uh, precision medicine approaches are probably um, the most promising, and it's probably the most promising pathology. Um, but even cancer is ultimately a multi-mechanism disease with a fair bit of resistance that's predictable. Next slide. And at core, the, uh, a lot of this argument about the challenge of complexity in biology rests on the fact that while we are doing, making all this effort to target Molecularly, tar molecularly or target genetically, there is this overwhelming role of behavior. This is for men and women, and this looks at the uh, association with cancer and BMI, and showing this extraordinarily high uh, relative risk of death um, with um, um, BMI among men for liver cancer, among women for uterine cancer, also women around breast cancer, men colon rectal cancer, showing that uh, much more easily detectable uh, phenotypes, things like BMI and behaviors, ultimately are, are uh, directly associated with pathology in a way that we both understand and that is, uh, gives us much more certitude that we'll be able to do something about it. So that's point one. Number one is that we have enormous challenges in complexity in biology, and I think many of our precision medicine approaches are uh, making claims that are eliding some of the challenges we're going to have in getting to a place where these molecularly targeted or genetically targeted approaches will make a real difference. Next slide. The next point is that many precision medicine approaches target, uh, conflate individual and population, and that observations that have utility at the population level do not necessarily have utility at the individual level. Next slide. This is a fairly uh, standard and typical uh, dose-response relationship showing a uh, genotype score. Uh, this was uh, shown uh, from a group that was published here at Boston University, and the likelihood of type 2 diabetes. And I show this slide because it's a fairly compelling slide that in some respect gets at the very heart of the argument for precision medicine. If you look at this, you'll say, wow, look at this genotype score. If I had the genotype score, would I have a higher criminal incidence of diabetes? That is the type of compelling narrative that emerges from precision, from precision medicine approaches. The problem is that this is true at the population level. When you get at the individual level, next slide, what you see is that uh, when you take this exact same data and map it out, genotype scores still on the x-axis, and you look at the percent of subjects with and without diabetes, which are the black and the gray lines, the two curves are, are fairly indistinguishable, meaning that having 
a genotype score tells you very little about whether the likelihood, what the likelihood is of you, the individual, having disease, which means that a lot of these observations from a population level, which ultimately is what we're doing from large sample studies that get us at molecular and genetic targeting, have relatively little utility at the individual level. And in case you're wondering, when do, when do these findings have utility at the individual level? Next slide. As this slide shows, you need to be at the bottom right of this uh, figure. This is a mathematical simulation uh, from out in California. Here you need an odds ratio of about 350 to have the kind of individual predictive utility that we frequently assume is going to emerge from precision medicine approaches. Now, here's the good news or the bad news. Uh, the good news or the bad news is that uh, there is nothing much new, in fact, about this argument in that we have, uh, we have much experience with uh, medical, individual medical approaches that we think make a difference for population health. Remember, the question I'm, I'm, I'm asking is, will these approaches improve population health? That is the question I'm most interested in. And, but in fact, they do not really improve population health. And to take one very simple example is the extraordinary drop in infectious diseases over the course of the 20th century. And everybody knows that the drop in infectious diseases over the 20th century is one of the principal reasons for the prolongation in life expectancy. And as this slide shows, you see the drop in infectious diseases, you see the spike for the influenza pandemic, but you also see where penicillin was introduced. And the introduction of penicillin, as you can see there, had made barely a dent in the drop in infectious disease mortality. That does not mean that penicillin doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that antibiotics are not very important, and they're not very important for the clinical care of patients who have infections. What it does mean, however, is that at the population level, there was many other factors that mattered to improve health in the context, in the context of infectious diseases. And one last point on this, next slide. This is a clinical prediction model looking at prediction of diabetes. And uh, what you see here is a variety of lines on this. The red line is clinical prediction model. And the orange, blue, and purple lines are clinical prediction models adding multiple um, uh, genetic loci. And what you see is exactly the same, the same curve for all along, suggesting that what we know clinically, what we can tell phenotypically, what we can tell symptomatically, ultimately gets us uh, results that are as useful as Molecularly, target, molecularly targeted or genetically targeted approaches. Point three, next slide, which is that much of the precision medicine discussion is also embeds within it the assumption that if we understand uh, precision medicine, if we understand precisely what our risk is, that we will behave differently, that, we, that populations will behave differently. Unfortunately, data does not really bear this out. There are several papers on this, but next slide. A recent review that just came out about the impact of community genetic risks on diseases um, uh, risks of disease on risk-reducing health behavior, next slide, suggests that expectations communicating DNA-based risk estimates change in behavior is not supported by existing evidence. So those are three reasons why I am actually skeptical, why I call myself the opposition on the, what I think is a very compelling idea that has utility, but I'm not so sure has direct utility in the short term for population health. But now, moving on to the next slide. Let me tell you why I think this matters. I think this discussion is not simply an academic discussion. It's not a discussion, academic discussion between Professor Curry and myself. I actually think this matters for three important reasons. Number one, next slide. Number one is uh, that this kind of discussion, the fact that we are investing a fair bit of our federal research eggs into this particular basket is distracting us from matter, from issues that matter more. And those issues that matter more are all issues of population health. Everybody on here knows who's in, in the United States that um, the um, that health indicators in the United States are nowhere near as good as many of our peer countries. Next slide. What is frequently not known, though, this is from the National Academy of Medicine report, is that it wasn't always like this. The red dot is the U.S., the gray dot are other uh, high-income countries. And what you see is that while everybody has gone up, the U.S. has over the past 35 years drifted inexorably and slowly towards the very bottom of the pile. This is what's important, and this is what I worry. Uh, that uh, distractions like precision medicine will take, will, will take away our eye off the prize, and the prize is improving population health. Another illustration is, in a, is life expectancy, and this enormous widening in life expectancy we're seeing in the U.S. Next slide. This uh, looks at um, life expectancy in the U.S. for women. Men looks roughly the same, dividing people by quintiles. And what you see is that life expectancy has only increased for women for the richest 20%. In fact, it stayed the same for the middle 60%. has decreased for the lowest 20%. This is something which most people, when uh, we first ask them, what percent of people have not had an increase in life expectancy? We tend not to guess. That's actually as high as 80%. And despite the fact that we as a country have spent an extraordinary amount of time in the past seven years uh, discussing the Affordable Care Act and uh, focusing on 
on other efforts to improve clinical medical care in this country. Next slide. You see that the percent of adults 65 years or older who have problems accessing healthcare services remains substantially higher than it is in other peer countries. So point one is that an effort on precision medicine to the exclusion of all else misses, misses, the, important, misses the important questions of population health. Point two, next slide, is that it also uh, makes for uh, uh, missed resource allocation and uh, it uh, unfortunately sets us in poor stead in terms of investing in the future. Uh, next slide. I right now happen to live in the state of Massachusetts, which uh, is, uh, considers itself fairly forward-looking on issues of health. Uh, I live in Boston, where, there are, where the health industry is the largest industry in town. But when you look even at um, Massachusetts state spending, uh, you see that uh, health care spending, or medical care spending more accurately, has gone up in the past 14 years, while spending in everything else, primary, secondary education, law, public safety, mental health, public health, higher education, early childhood education, environment, and recreation has consistently gone down. And this is the danger of uh, focusing our attention too much on efforts that are implicitly medical in their approach, that are about molecular targeting, genetic targeting, that they distract us from investing in the areas that are ultimately going to improve the health of populations. And our federal funders, National Institutes of Health being the most important single health funder in the world, is not immune to this. If you go to the next slide, if you look at, um, this is something that you can do yourself from an NIH reporter, proportion of NIH fund, uh, funding awarded to projects with the terms genetic or genetics in the title abstract or terms over the past 10 years. The blue line is actual, the red line is just a fitted line. You see that that's gone up. Next slide. And conversely, proportion of NIH funding awarded projects with the terms population, public, and title abstract or terms has gone down in the past 10 years. So, um, by the way, I will point out that the first um, um, y-axis was about 30% to 37%, while the next, this y-axis is 4% to about 0.4% just to give you a sense of the scope. So the second challenge, the second reason why I think this matters is because of resource allocation. Number three, and I think the third reason why this matters is that, uh, that we are investing so much, so much of, our, of our health capital in the broader public discussion that the precision medicine approach is leading to hype over hope. And uh, I'll just show you a couple of examples of where hype over hope and, uh, and uh, how we are repeating mistakes of the past. This slide is, uh, says the time has come in America when the same kind of concentrated effort that split the atom took man to the moon should be turned toward conquering the dread disease. Let us make a national, total national commitment to achieve this goal. This was, of course, President Richard Nixon declaring the war on cancer in uh, 1970. In, well, the, the National Cancer Act was 1971. He made the statement in December of 1970. Well, how was the war on cancer done? The next slide looks at that and uh, shows that uh, the war on cancer in and of itself has really made a nary a dent on cancers. What you actually see is the um, decrease in cancers largely due to the stopping on smoking, having very little to do with the medical approaches that were advocated. And, and, and much of the approach we're seeing around precision medicine and many of its ancillary offshoots are doing much the same thing. If you look at the next slide, uh, this is um, uh, President Obama saying last year, Vice President Biden said that a new moonshot America can cure cancer. Let's make America the country, country that cures cancer once and for all. These are very much repeating the same types of efforts where we are investing extraordinary resources in medical clinical approaches while turning a blind eye to what is important, which is improving population health. And this has consequences. It has consequences for how the health enterprise is seen in the broader public, uh, leading us to one of my favorite cartoons, which is next slide which uh, says, has the uh, news reporter reading today's random medical news saying that coffee can cause depression in twins, but equally well, he could have said that uh, computer terminals can cause hypothermia in overweight smokers. And it's this is the, is the type of roulette that we find ourselves on as we focus ever more on molecular and genetic targeting at the expense of broader efforts to improve population health. Next slide. So I said no unless. So let me just talk about unless. What do I mean by unless? Well, I mean unless uh, a precision medicine approach or a precision population health approach, as the Professor Curry will talk about shortly, ultimately focuses on populations, unless we take a real hard look about how this fits in with an agenda that is relentlessly pushing the question of how we improve the health of many. Next slide. This is a population. The population is messy, it's interconnected, has spatial interdependencies. People have uh, interact with one another and have uh, behavior changes that are reflected by context and by inter-individual inter uh, relationships. Next slide. What uh, we're doing with, uh, with uh, precision medicine approaches is uh, ultimately taking these populations and uh, focusing ever more on smaller and smaller subsets. Next slide. 
But what we instead should be doing is we should be looking at whole populations. We should be saying these are diseases in populations. Next slide. And we should be doing whatever we can to improve the social, economic, cultural context uh, that takes these, these individuals with pathology in whole populations. Next slide. And reduces number of people with pathology. So let me wrap up. I have two minutes left. Um, I, I, I realize that uh, in uh, speaking as the loyal opposition in the context of uh, precision medicine population health, I run the risk a little bit of, uh, of painting myself into a corner as being the sort of the guy who doesn't like technology, who doesn't like uh, innovation, doesn't like advance. And I, I, want, to be, I want to be clear that um, that's far from, far from the truth. I actually, um, uh, I think there is a lot that can be learned, a lot that can be gained from the type of molecular genetic targeting that is going to emerge from precision medicine. My uh, argument is not with the utility of these approaches for mechanistic biological and medical work. My argument is with the substitution of an intellectual and a funding agenda towards the improvement of population health with what ultimately is a medical agenda that will help the few. And, but just to end on, on a quote, this is um, the, the, the uh, again, the counter to my argument will be, well, but look, give this a chance. This is something that we should put our shoulders to the, to the heavy rock and push it and together. I know there's a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished before the end of the century. Yet current technology has attained level of sophistication where it's reasonable for us to begin this effort. It will take years, probably decades of efforts on many fronts. There will be failures and setbacks just as there will be successes and breakthroughs. And as we proceed, we must remain constant. Isn't it worth every investment necessary? We know it is. And that's the kind of inspirational talk that um, I think is reasonable to affix to something that is, you know, a little bit futuristic and say, like, surely we should do this. Surely we should invest our money in it. Well, this quote is, by the way, President Ronald Reagan when he announced the launch of Star Wars as the National Defense Missile Shield. And um, I just put it up there because I think it's got the kind of inspirational language and an untested approach that ultimately ended up um, not doing anybody any good. So just to end, next slide. Uh, I started off by calling myself the loyal opposition. This is the two kings walking by. One of them saying my loyal opposition wasn't loyal enough. I do, uh, to go back to my point at the beginning, I do think that uh, I am loyal to the aspirations of science. I am excited by the uh, uh, mechanistic and medical potential of genetic molecular targeting. I'm much less excited about its potential to improve population health. And I'll end with a metaphor. Next slide. This is uh, um, my goldfish, and uh, I'd say it's a goldfish that I care very much about. I would like the goldfish to be healthier, to be happier. And um, I can do two things to make my goldfish happier and healthier. I can make sure that my goldfish uh, always uh, eats the little food I put at the top uh, in a um, in a measured way and doesn't eat too much. Make sure that my goldfish uh, swims around its bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times counterclockwise every uh, regular basis. I can make sure that my goldfish has safe goldfish sex. I can also make sure that uh, I genotype my goldfish and understand fully the mechanisms of its uh, cancer so I can fix it when it's cancer, when it develops cancer. Or I could, yes, do all that, but I could centrally and importantly recognize that everything about my goldfish's health is determined by the water the goldfish swims in. And unless I actually uh, clean its water and create the social, cultural, economic environments to promote it, its health. Everything else I do is futile. Next slide. And uh, that's it. I will stop there. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Galea. I'll now turn the mic over to Dr. Muin Khoury. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Debbie. And uh, Sandro, you're a hard act to follow. Uh, my answer to the question Will precision medicine improve population health? You've answered the but in my yes, uh, but I do not think it's a distraction. There are lots of challenges you've raised around the complexity in the biology, the individual versus population focus, the behavioral change issues, the hype and the hope. And I personally spending uh, uh, relatively a long time between shuttling between NIH and CDC trying to kind of bridge the, the worlds of medicine and public health. I have four themes I'd like to elaborate on, and uh, some of you who are following this discussion would see a lot of similarities and overlap between uh, Sandro's ideas and mine. So the first theme is that in order to improve population health, we have always needed medicine and public health. When you get sick, you want to have the best available drugs and medications and interventions. And when you're not sick, you want to keep, uh, you want to prevent disease and promote health. And this easy, uneasy relationship between medicine and public health has been going on for decades. And I know usually medicine gets all the glory, but there is a lot of 
um, uh, accomplishments that public health have, have made over the years. And as we move from medicine to precision medicine, I think that same tenet applies, that as we be begin to have molecularly targeted treatments of cancer, and we have a few examples of those, there are some success stories, we still need public health. So this sort of dichotomy or a distraction saying that, um, you know, doing one at the expense of the other, uh, it's because we always need both, and we can never forget that point. And the thing that I wanted to uh, impress on the group here is sort of the evolving definition of precision medicine. I'd like to end up with it at the end. Um, precision medicine is not just about genes. It's a new emerging approach that includes both prevention and treatment that also includes environment and lifestyle. So if we subscribe to the idea that precision medicine is only about genetics, then Sandro's uh, notion is, is very much fulfilled. So just to highlight the need for both uh, population and individual approaches, uh, this is a paper from Jonathan Fielding from a few years ago that highlights the, the need for both approaches uh, as you go from well to being uh, sick and dead. And, you, you know, there are activities you do at the individual level and the societal level, and all of these things need to be done, and they should not be done at the expense of one another. Our leader at CDC, Tom Frieden, has put up his own version of this, sort of the, the health impact pyramid, the five uh, levels of interventions at the population level. Of course, if you work at the base of the pyramid, provide opportunities for uh, to wipe out poverty and improve socioeconomic status, you're going to improve health. Uh, of course, uh, that will have the, the largest impact at the population level. At the top of the pyramid, going one-on-one, -on -one, talking to people, uh, and clinical interventions will, will uh, achieve lesser of an impact. So what am I saying here? Am I agreeing with Sandro? Yes, of course I'm agreeing with Sandro, but we cannot have this discussion and say precision medicine versus public health. To me, it's a false dichotomy. We need both. We need both an era where uh, medicine uh, can become more precise as well as public health can do its work. And I think my ending argument is uh, at the end that public health will become more precise as medicine will become more precise. So the second theme of my talk is that there is a lot we can do now to implement what we already know. This is not a, a pie in the sky. There is, of course, a lot of hype, but there is a lot of hope. And I reflected that on the paper I wrote last year with Jim Evans about balancing long-term knowledge generation, which is now uh, geared up with a one million person cohort with early health benefit. If you take a look at a, a cohort of a million people, there are thousands of people that can benefit from interventions at the molecular or other level that they may not currently be uh, benefiting from. So m melding intervention and implementation science with discovery science is very important at this point. The CDC has been maintaining this uh, uh, simple tiered classification of genomic tests, and let's stick with genomics for a little while. Uh, the tier ones are those that are applications that are ready to be put in play. Uh, a few of the cancers, newborn screening, which affects all uh, newborns in the United States, and all the way ranging to tier three, which is not ready for prime time, as uh, Sandro mentioned about the personal genomic test and uh, direct to consumer. But there is a whole uh, uh, shades in between of the tier two. And if you think about some of the tier one, there are already uh, many examples and millions of people that can be affected uh, by these uh, things. Two examples, uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and Lynch syndrome. Yes, we do affect uh, a small fraction of all cancers, but th that translates to thousands of preventable cancers every, every year in the United States. And uh, uh, there are actions that public health can do now uh, to prevent uh, certain cancers associated with these hereditary conditions. And a public health healthcare partnership will be needed because healthcare alone does not seem to be uh, ascertaining those uh, people who need the services, genetic counseling, and some of the interventions that, uh, that currently work. Uh, and there are disparities. Of course, if you are in public health, we have to worry about disparities, not only in the upstream research, but implementation. And this is data from a very large a uh, data set of 15 million insured people that shows the disparities of utilization of BRCA testing in young women with breast cancer by race and ethnicity. So the third theme that I want to uh, continue on this journey is that 
Public health is a partner in the development of precision medicine, and what we call public health sciences, uh, I'll tell you a few of them as we go along, are essential in ensuring the success of precision medicine. Let me elaborate on that. So a few years ago, Francis Collins put out this uh, vision for the future of medicine in which he portrayed uh, this 23-year-old man named John who goes for his uh, primary health care uh, checkup and he gets this uh, fictitious printout of genes and then a personalized intervention strategy to mitigate the risk of these various diseases. But let me ask the question here, where do you get these numbers to begin with? These numbers can be only gotten from large-scale population studies. And uh, as Sandra uh, showed us, some of these uh, current hits are not that predictive, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. But the question is, what do you do with these numbers when you get them? Because there is a whole lot of things that can be done. So a case in point is this discussion about mammography, which is a, sort of a, a population-wide screening effort that's been uh, discussed at the forefront, and all these uh, uh, changing strategies in uh, how, how often uh, do we need them at what age and uh, the various recommendations by different groups and different countries. And if you think about these uh, uh, sort of uh, not very predictive uh, uh, genetic factors that Sandro showed us a bit earlier, uh, they don't have to be too predictive, but you can think about uh, whether or not they can uh, be used in crossing a certain threshold for utilization. This is data from last year from uh, JNCI that shows on the basis of 80 SNPs, and now probably there's about 200 of them, the 10-year absolute risk of developing breast cancer for women with and without family history by this polygenic risk score that uh, was mentioned earlier. And depending on your cutoff in screening, you might decide to use the risk score, or at least in the informed uh, shared decision-making, because if, if you see the certain cutoff, uh, sometimes people cross that threshold at a younger age group if they have a higher genetic load, and it doesn't have to be as predictive of the phenotype that, uh, that we have in mind. So the question is, uh, the public health sciences are eminently needed to translate this uh, activity uh, of uh, what's going on with the precision medicine discoveries. And uh, Sandra showed us a slide that showed that um, we don't have enough of these population sciences. Here in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, about 30% of our uh, portfolio is in, uh, uh, in population sciences and precision medicine. M much of it is in epidemiology, but some of the other areas are, are growing. The literature actually shows a deficit of this public health genomic science beyond batch to benzide. About 1% of published genomic research is beyond the initial discoveries, and half of it obviously is in cancer because it's a hot area of discovery right now. So I want to close with the theme number four, which uh, if you remember uh, how we defined precision medicine uh, at the beginning, uh, I want to pause it to the, uh, the group here and have some maybe dialogue and discussion afterwards. As, as medicine moves into a precision medicine territory, I submit to you that public health is moving in that same space towards an era of precision public health, and let me explain that a bit more. Um, yes, uh, we know that there is complexity in biology, but there is more than biology involved. Uh, health and health outcomes are determined by multiple levels, uh, ranging from the molecules all the way to environmental and socioeconomic factors the exposome in, uh, in, in big ways, that, uh, and all of this technology is going to allow us to measure these things a, a little bit more than we've had before. So it's not just about genes. I've showed you examples of a few single gene disorders uh, earlier that uh, account for about 5 to 10 percent of the human disease, but our complex disease, which are the major killers, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, uh, that account for the majority of human diseases hopefully can be approached with this uh, uh, melding of the, all the exposures that come together. So it's not about our susceptibility anymore. It's about all the, uh, the various types of exposures and the genomes that we come across, including the microbiome, that there is more of them than us in our own body, if you will. Uh, the, there is that complex interactions that we're just beginning to skim the surface, and there are a few success stories but tremendous challenges. A promising area is epigenetics, which is more than just about uh, the gene sequence. It's, uh, it really it's the ultimate um, 
gene environment interaction because it um, it uses a life course approach uh, to look at the uh, impact of environmental factors on gene expression uh, across multiple generations. And uh, the promise for that is yet to be explored, but cannot be uh, uh, over, uh, uh, sort of, um, um, over, um, or overruled in a way. So I wanted just to um, end with a couple of these slides because um, we get stuck on, on words, and we have been using a lot of words, and sometimes the words become, uh, have a purpose of their, their, of their own. Uh, precision medicine has had its roots in the word personalized medicine, which means that uh, we apply things at the individual level. If you look at this Google trend search, uh, the blue shows how uh, the trends and utilization of precision medicine has taken off after the announcement of the Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015. But there is more to that because the 2011 um, uh, Precision Medicine National Research Council actually outlined a case for precision medicine beyond utilization of these technologies at the individual or person level. We know that there are lots of individual information that are very imprecise, like some of the data that uh, Sandro showed us. The direct-to-consumer genetic testing movement is a very imprecise movement, uh, and while it's really highly personal, it doesn't advance the cause of public health. Whereas sometimes you have precision medicine discoveries that uh, combine biological and environmental insight where the applications are not necessarily uh, for the people with a rare disease condition. Take, uh, for instance, uh, the use of statins. They were discovered because of a rare genetic disease of uh, cholesterol, familial hypercholesterolemia, but uh, a lot of people ha are benefiting from statin at the population level, regardless or not whether they have familial hypercholesterolemia. So our challenge ahead, really, is using and measuring all determinants of health from the macro to the micro to develop analytical approaches to population health. It's a question. And I think we, the technology is moving in that direction. So last year, I published this paper about big data meet, meeting um, um, public health and asked the question, can uh, our public health functions become more precise? We do a lot of surveillance where we track disease at the population level. We do develop policies, and then uh, we deliver interventions. Can we use the tools of analytical uh, data science and big data to do public health better. And as a matter of fact, there are three upcoming areas that we have initial success in using these tools at the population level, modernizing surveillance, pathogen genomics, and then the targeting. Pathogen genomics is uh, really the early front runner of precision medicine for public health, whose applications are not necessarily at the patient care level, but more at the pop population health and outbreak detection and response effective antibiotic use guidelines and reducing the burden of these uh, uh, conditions. And this is just one example from data from CDC showing that after the uh, use of whole genome sequencing in, um, in surveillance for uh, listeria outbreaks, we are now more able to link more of these outbreaks because of the sequence with the source of the food uh, from which the outbreak is derived as a result of whole genome sequencing of uh, listeria samples. Ultimately, at the, uh, at the population level, we want to use tracking in order to solve public health problems. So this uh, quote from WGS to GPS is reminding us, uh, all of us in public health know about Jon Snow and uh, the, uh, the Broad Street Pump. And uh, this is sort of um, a, a, a quote from Harvard uh, that uh, essentially posits that if Jon Snow was alive today, he would have solved the outbreak in uh, much more precisely and and uh, more quickly than he had at his disposal in 1859 or whenever he had to uh, uh, painstakingly try to map uh, where people drank the, the water that was infested with Vibrio and correlating it with the, with the outcomes of interest. And last but not least, I would like to uh, uh, mention Sue Desmond Hellman from the CEO, the CEO of the Gates Foundation, who's been thinking uh, along the same lines of trying to come up with a new era of precision public health. For those of you who don't know, uh, Sue Desmond Hellman uh, was at UCSF. She was one of the architects of the uh, National Research Council report of 2011 and is now leading the Gates Foundation global health effort 
to think about how we can bring the analytical tools of data science and others to do tracking and understanding disease at the population level uh, so that we can improve health, uh, not only for rich people, but uh, across the globe. So in conclusion, the four themes that I have presented to you uh, are as follows, that uh, as we move into uh, uh, these new tools and technologies, we still need both uh, medicine and public health to improve population health. That was uh, true before. Precision approaches will always be true even after precision approaches. The partnerships are needed to implement what we already know and what we will know even 10 years from now because there are opportunities to save lives now that we are not capitalizing on in that precision medicine space. And then public health sciences are needed to generate and implement the new knowledge that's, uh, that's coming from the bench. And finally, we are entering a new era of precision public health that's not just about genes, drugs, and diseases. And with that, I conclude my talk and turn it back to Abby. Thank you very much. Thank you to Sandra and Moline for their presentations. We will now open the floor for questions. As mentioned, questions can be submitted using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen via WebEx. Please type your question in the provided field and hit submit. For those in the room at NCI, we ask that you approach and activate a microphone before acting, asking your question. With that, I'll turn it over to NCI's Dr. Amy Kennedy to moderate the Q&A. Amy? Okay, as we wait for questions coming in, if anyone in the room here at NCI, just speak up, uh, come up to a microphone or... Um, Hi, Sandra. It's Ann Geiger. How are you? Hi, Ann. How are you? Good to hear from you. You too. So I'm going to pose to both of you this, this question, which is, it seems to me that there's an important matter of economics. The question is... Yeah, my light isn't lighting up, but anyway. I, I, and all I heard was economics, then you cut out. Okay, we're going to move microphones. There we go. So for me, this, you know, Sandra, these issues of funding basic science over population science have existed for decades. Um, you know, they're, they're a legacy. I think we're all aware of it. I, I think my question for both of you is we have limited budget. And so, you know, I wonder if the two of you have a different perspective on where is bang for the buck? Because I think I heard implicit difference in the two of you. Um, Sandro, you referred to things like antibiotics and I would say public works that are actually pretty cost effective for what we got from them. And for me, the question is, is precision medicine screening public health going to be similarly cost effective. So I'm curious to know what you two think. Well, I can take a first crack. Um, I actually think economics is at the very heart of my argument. Uh, if, um, if we had limitless resources, I, I actually probably would take a lot of my argument off the table because then I would say, God bless, let us invest in molecular genetic targeting and uh, let's also invest in efforts that improve the health of populations so we can actually create a, a better world. But the challenge, of course, is, as everybody knows, that uh, we are in this country, just focusing on the U.S. for a second, we spend uh, about at least 6% more on GDP and, uh, in health than any other country. We have the worst indicators of any of the, uh, our peer high-income countries, and a lot of that is ultimately misallocation of resources. So my, at the heart of my argument is, is a concern with resource allocation. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that uh, resources come from different buckets and different pools, and uh, it's not a simple matter of saying, well, let's take the money that's being spent on precision medicine and shift it into uh, more population-based approaches. It doesn't work that way. But at the end of the day, it's our broader national conversation that determines where we put our, which basket we put our eggs in. And my worry is that we have a momentum behind an individualistic approach that has reached its apotheosis in a precision medicine approach, and my worry is that it crowds out everything else. Again, my, just to be very clear about my argument, I think there is a lot of, of utility at the level of science that can emerge from these precision medicine approaches. My worry is that it crowds out everything else, so really it comes down to politics and resource allocation. 
Okay, <clears throat> this is Moeen here. So uh, I, I do not disagree with you, Sandro, and I think the question is well posed and the economics is always an issue. And uh, as someone who has pre uh, you know, spent most of his career in a public health agency, I can attest to that. Uh, the question is, uh, right now, um, is whether or not uh, investments in both the uh, population sciences and basic science, I mean, the case that I made is that a more holistic investment is first likely to uh, make pre precision medicine succeed, and second, it would lead to a new era of precision public health. So that's the sort of the argument I'm, I'm putting forward. I'm not trying to pit uh, one agency versus another. I'm saying that, uh, you know, that the investment, uh, the return on investment, uh, if we are to take on precision medicine moving forward, will be much better and much faster if we, uh, as we learn new knowledge, we implement what we already know, and we use the same technology at the population level to track and measure population health problems and then target uh, the interventions when, where they are needed the most based on any number of factors, and they don't have to be genetics. It could be based on geography, on, uh, on uh, uh, the resource allocation. And so economics is always at the heart of it, but I'm hoping that moving forward, this would not be a competition, but a collaboration between uh, the various sectors of uh, uh, public health medicine and the basic sciences. Okay. This is uh, Debbie Wynn, um, question for, for both of you. you know, sometimes, fundamentally, I think, well, precision medicine, really all that means is, 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 is risk stratification or prognosis stratification or um, stratification on the basis of, of treatment. And I'm trying to reconcile that with, um, with, with equity access. Um, so to some, some extent, if we really are going to achieve some level of equity and um, reduce disparities, that there has to be some level of detailed and precise stratification of groups of people into subgroups, and that by doing that, we could perhaps, in, in appropriately targeting those subgroups, we could have better health than we could at, at, at some measure that might be more cost effective and, and, and reach a larger community, but maybe not have quite the, the impact. Um, do you want to talk about that issue of, of equity and access uh, disparities? Thanks. Uh, Muin will go first. So, I mean, equity, access, and disparities are at the heart of the public health, um, <clears throat> uh, I guess, the public health mandate. And if you, uh, just to uh, repeat some of the same argument that I just elaborated on, that uh, for precision medicine to succeed and succeed widely across the population, it's not enough uh, to uh, do the discovery, even if the discovery includes uh, a wide cross-section of the population because I, I know the current precision medicine initiative is trying very hard to be inclusive across the population, but also uh, dealing with the equities of uh, implementation of the new discoveries. And as I said earlier, I mean, I showed some data uh, that shows even with the things that we know what to do, like with any new technologies, they're not uh, well uh, implemented uh, across the population. So could we use, if we put genetics aside for a minute, uh, some of the new uh, analytics and data science and visualization, could we be, could we be able to show um, more uh, robustly and more persuasively some of these disparities that, uh, that could be, um, uh, that are rampant across the population for which uh, resource allocation needs to occur? So I, I think I'm not too far with, from Sandra on that point because uh, it, it's at the heart of the argument that there is uh, uh, disparities that need to be dealt with. Dr. Galea? Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. I think uh, the only thing I would add is, is that the, the, the question underlines a tension that I don't think we have been fully honest in grappling with uh, the broader society, which is the tension between advancing efficient, targeted efforts that improve the health of a few and the inevitable trade-off that results in terms of widening health equity gaps. And will, uh, will high-end medical therapies based on genetic and molecular targeting result in potentially better clinical care for a small subset of people who get really sick? Probably. 
Will that also widen health gaps? Almost certainly. Is that something? Is, it, is that a price we're willing to pay? I don't know that we have discussed that as a society, and I also don't think the discussion playing field is not level, and uh, for obvious reasons, and that there are many special interests that uh, push such discussions in, in a very particular way. So it strikes me as um, almost canonical that uh, these approaches, as with any other high-end technological approaches, will result in widening health gaps in the short and medium term, whether or not they have success in improving health in the long term and eventually a narrowing of health gaps remains a subject of debate. Okay, taking a question from online, uh, would you say that familial hypocholesterolemia, a common genetic disorder affecting one in 250 people, could be a good example of what precision health could mean for heart disease prevention at the population level? Yeah, <clears throat> can I take that one, uh, Sandro? Because uh, all yours. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> our office at CDC has been uh, has promoted and put uh, familial hypercholesterolemia as one of these tier one green applications. It didn't show up on my slides today because I'm at the NCI and the focus mostly on cancer. So let's take uh, FH. Uh, FH is an interesting story by itself. It's the uh, a genetic disease that's not rare. It's actually the most common genetic disease. We have data that shows from NHANES that it's about one in 200, 250 people in the U.S. have it. A very high early premature heart disease risk, but it accounts for less than 5% of all heart attacks. So in terms of the magnitude of the burden, um, it, it's not that big in terms of a population attributable fraction. But there are thousands of patients who have FH and their relatives who could benefit from early detection and treatment with statins that are not being cared for right now. And I think using uh, this uh, precision tools to find them and, uh, you know, registering them, and there, there are different studies that have been uh, um, shown recently to be able to track uh, FH at the population level is, yes, an example of uh, a precision approach at the population level, similarly to what you can call newborn screening as a program. Newborn screening, I mean, we screen 4 million babies every year to find 10,000 or so who have one or more uh, genetic conditions like PKU. That's truly a, a population-wide effort that benefits the few that otherwise would not have benefited from uh, health care by themselves or they could have had mental retardation. So yeah, it is an example of uh, precision uh, public health. Another question from online viewing, I think it's directed towards you. Can you elaborate on the potential of epigenetics to bridge the approaches of social, environmental, behavioral, and genetic factors influence in population health? Well, I mean, like with all technologies, there is both hope and hype about epigenetics, and uh, uh, I'm here at NCI where there are many more epigenetics experts. Uh, than I am, but I don't see anyone here. But um, I want to refer um, people to a blog I wrote a couple of years ago after I gave a talk at uh, Public Health, uh, uh, the Association for State and Territorial Health Officials uh, annual meeting on why epigenetics is so uh, appealing to public health. You know, when you talk about genes, you can't change the genes and the effects are small, but epigenetics is one of those areas where truly the environmental social determinants of health uh, really come face-to-face uh, -face with the biology. And, uh, you know, both from the experimental studies and even some of the human studies, we know that genes can be turned on and off, especially at the right time in, uh, in growth and development. Now, are the applications here? I mean, there are a few, uh, few applications. Uh, it's mostly the promise of using epigenetics and epigenetic markers as, as a union between nature and nurture. So I'll, um, I'll stop there, and uh, if people want to know more info, I'm happy to correspond with them. Andrew, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, that's fine. I think in the absence of any additional questions, um, we should give both of our speakers a few moments for a couple of last words. No, I mean, this was a good uh, discussion today, Sandro. I appreciated your willingness to uh, engage in this discussion. I'm hoping uh, 
uh, I'm uh, hoping that this dialogue will continue and some, uh, uh, some of the uh, challenges that you raise will be uh, looked at very seriously, uh, both from uh, uh, funding perspectives as well as uh, societal perspectives and, and so on and so forth, because at the end of the day, uh, all the new tools and technologies with all their promises are not going to uh, uh, imp lead to improved population health unless we use them and we use them judiciously at the right time and do not forget about some of the other things that we have to do as well. So thank you. Yeah, okay. no, thank you for having me. I, I, I enjoyed the discussion. My, um, my, my feeling about this is uh, there, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of very good scientists and, uh, and uh, health uh, thinkers who are engaged in this, and uh, perhaps this is why I started my presentation by casting myself as a loyal position. I'm deeply committed to the goals and aspirations of science uh, towards improving health, and uh, my, uh, my commitment and belief is that uh, we need to have this kind of conversation to try to nudge us in where we should be and uh, figure out what the space is. So I, I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. In these last moments, I'd like to take time to thank Drs. Wynn, Galea, Curry, and Kennedy for their time. Thank you to all of us who joined today in person via the web. The session is concluded. You may disconnect at this time. <laughs>